Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Hoda, and I'm going to talk about modeling human perceptions of allocation policies with uncertain outcomes. So societies frequently wrestle with the difficult decision regarding the allocations of benefits and harms among their uh, members and citizens. Policy choices in uh, many domains, including the ones listed on the slide, entail such harm or benefit allocations. Now, these decisions, particularly those that involve harms, are immensely difficult yet often unavoidable. While we should generally strive to reduce harms uh, as much as possible, to the extent that they cannot be eliminated altogether, we need to uh, reason about the impact of such policies, um, in particular those that produce foreseeable harms and benefits. So uh, Sunstein makes this point in the extreme case where the harm in question is foreseeable deaths resulting from government uh, policies such as uh, building new highways or uh, new, building new power, uh, power plants. So uh, as is the case in Sunstein's examples of driving on highways uh, and environmental pollutants, many policies lead to allocations that uh, result in probabilities of some outcome occurring. For example, when we raise the speed limit by a certain amount, uh, we, can ex uh, we can estimate uh, relatively reliably uh, the number of additional traffic fatalities that will result. But we can say much less about who in particular will be harmed. So uh, the policy process uh, necessarily involves a set of decisions, even if those uh, decisions are implicit between different distributions of harm or benefit over the population. So our goal in this work is to understand people's perceptions toward allocation policies that lead to such uncertain outcomes. Now, uh, I should emphasize at the outset that our intention in exploring people's subjective perceptions of probabilistic allocations is not to prescribe a best mode uh, of allocating uh, probabilities of harm or benefit. Rather, uh, it is purely a, an interpretative or descriptive undertaking. Uh, we find that preferences for certain allocations uh, involving probabilities are different, uh, difficult to explain unless we take uh, probability perceptions uh, into account. So uh, the key question uh, we would like to answer is how should we compare two different distributions of harm or benefit that arise from uh, different policy alternatives? So uh, much of the work that underpins mathematical models in these uh, domains, including uh, many of the loss functions that go into algorithmic decision making, tend to be based on expected cost uh, benefit analysis. The idea that we generally favor a policy that produces uh, the lower expected harm or higher expected benefit. But uh, is that sufficient to capture people's responses uh, to different um, uh, allocations? So we argue using a simple example that different allocations have um, different allocations can have very different subjective resonances, even if they lead to the same expected harm or benefit. And these differences cannot be explained with expected utility analysis alone. So here is the example. Suppose we need to allocate one unit of harm among 100 individuals. For simplicity, let's assume in this stylized example that uh, all 100 individuals involved are equally deserving and willing to bear the harm. Uh, so here are several alternatives we could consider. So we might allocate the harm to one specific person, say Bob, while giving the other 99 people certainty that, that they are not at risk. Um, another alternative is uh, feeling sorry for Bob, we might instead divide the risk between him and another member of the population, let's call her Chloe, and ultimately flip a coin to decide which one of them is to bear the harm. Um, so this leaves the other 98 people free and clear. So uh, a third alternative could be to have a third person, let's say David, join Bob and Chloe in the risk pool, pool lowering the risk for each of them to one third um, and letting the other 97 uh, be clear. Finally, if we continue down that path, we might allocate the risk evenly uh, among all 100 individuals and select the recipient of the harm by a pure, uh, 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 purely at random uh, with a random lottery. Now, uh, note that each of these alternatives that I just described ultimately result in the same amount of harm. Uh, in, in this case, one unit uh, uh, 
of hauling the population. And at the same time, they struck us as intuitively quite different. Uh, for example, we may consider it blatantly unfair to single Bob out as a certain victim by concentrating the risk uh, completely on him. And indeed, a long line of work in psychology uh, uh, on the so-called identifiable victim effects suggest that we tend to find such outcomes particularly troubling. On the other hand, a, land, a random lottery distributes the risk equally among all 100 individuals, but uh, this is at the expense of forcing everybody to worry about their chances of being harmed. The second and third alternatives that I uh, mentioned provide intermediate options, uh, in particular in the second alternative where we flip a coin to decide between Chloe um, and Bob, uh, uh, we, uh, one person is, uh, uh, no one person is harmed with certainty, while at the same time, the smallest possible number of individuals uh, have a positive uh, uh, chance of being harmed. So the fact that we may prefer some of these alternatives to others immediately suggests that uh, the, the cost-benefit analysis based on expected uh, harm or benefit is not sufficient to capture our intuitions. Um, uh, again, since all the options involve the same expected amount of harm uh, in this question, but we have uh, we seem to have preferences over which ones uh, we prefer and which ones we don't like. So uh, likewise, our intuitive reactions to these differences do not uh, seem to neatly map onto common concerns uh, with distributive justice, where we generally tend to worry about the relative impact of allocations on different social groups and uh, keeping the existing social inequalities in mind. So uh, our reaction in particular, in, uh, in the case of our example, have nothing to do with any details about who Bob, Chloe, uh, and uh, David happen to be. Uh, or the social group they happen to belong to. What we perceive to be um, the more desirable allocation instead seems to rest solely on how we perceive the benefit or harm of being subject to uncertain outcomes. So um, an abstraction of these considerations uh, would, con uh, would therefore consider multiple probability distributions of harm or benefit. For example, we could have one policy alternative P producing a distribution P1 up to Pn, um, and, a, and, and another policy alternative Q producing a distribution Q1 up to Qn of probabilities across n individuals. And, and then we ask which of these should be preferred, uh, which, which of these is preferred as a choice uh, for society. Now, uh, in posing such questions, we are guided by the belief that studying reactions to distributions uh, of harm or benefit uh, that are uncertain and probabilistic should really draw uh, on those parts of behavioral sciences that study people's subjective evaluation of probabilities. As a result, we develop a framework based on the concept of probability weighting from behavioral economics. So a uh, probability weighting uh, models people's preferences regarding choices that have uncertain outcomes. A great deal of empirical evidence has suggested that people often do not treat probabilities linearly, but rather they overrate small probabilities and underrate large probabilities. So uh, one class of probability functions that are widely studied uh, are those pro uh, proposed by Prelec uh, that are, uh, are depicted in the plot you see here. So note the inverse S-shaped form of this function. So early on, it is concave, overrating small probabilities. Later on, it becomes convex, underrating large probabilities. So uh, given this concept of probability weighting, um, we consider a society consisting of n probability weighting individuals. We index these individuals by one up to n. Uh, we, uh, we consider a policymaker who needs to choose uh, between various policy alternatives that probabilistically allocate uh, a, a fixed amount of harm or benefit to individuals in this society. Uh, following prospect theory, we assume that uh, every individual in, in this society has an inverse S-shaped probability weighting function um, denoted by W, where W of P determines the individual's perception of probability P. Now, uh, in order to design a policy that uh, such probability weighting individuals perceive favorably, the policymaker aims to understand the distribution that optimizes their perceived welfare, uh, which has been formally written in the equation you see on this slide. Uh, 
So note again that W is neither concave uh, nor convex, so standard optimization methods are not readily applicable here. So what we do in the remainder of this talk is to characterize the solutions to this optimization problem. So when, it, when it's the case of benefits, we would like to maximize the perceived benefit. And when it's uh, the case of allocating harm, we would like to minimize, we would like to understand what's the allocation that minimizes the perceived harm. So uh, our findings at a high level show that perceptions toward harm and benefit are fundamentally different. When allocating benefits among uh, an individuals, uh, the perceived benefit maximizing solution consists of providing everyone with a non-zero chance of obtaining a benefit. But in sharp contrast, when we are allocating harms, the equal allocation of risk is suboptimal and the perceived harm minimizing allocation uh, instead concentrates the risk on a smaller subset of individuals, uh, leaving the rest of the population to enjoy a zero risk of harm. So uh, we begin our analysis with the case of allocating R units of harm among N individuals. And we characterize the perceived harm minimizing distributions um, uh, in our stylized model. In particular, we show that for any given total harm level R, the optimal solution to the perceived harm minimizing uh, problem concentrates the risk on a subset of the population. Let's, uh, let's say it's of size K, where K is less than N, the total size of the population. Um, and uh, the distribution, the, the optimal distribution is such that each member of the at-risk subset uh, has a probability of harm bounded away from zero, while the rest of the population has a probability of harm equal to zero. So uh, the optimal K, the, uh, the size of the at-risk population for various values of R, the total harm, uh, increases roughly linearly as a function of R when uh, the total size of the population is uh, fixed at a large number. So when policymakers make risk allocation decisions in the real world, uh, we argue that the resulting policies sometimes resemble the perceived harm minimizing allocations that we just talked about. Uh, we present several examples of policies allocating uh, significant but potentially diffuse harms that uh, we believe we would struggle to explain without recourse to probability weighting. Again, uh, we are not offering these examples to claim that policymakers do or should explicitly take probability weighting into account when making policy decisions, uh, but we rather offer them here as suggestive evidence that probability weighting may play a role even if it's an implicit one in leading policymakers or the public to perceive certain uh, policy outcomes as more attractive in real world setting. And it's therefore important uh, to consider as one factor. So um, as an example, uh, consider the policies for drafting people into the military in the US. So the government here has considered a number of different implementations for randomizing the selection of inductees. Uh, so under a given policy, individual, uh, each individual would learn that they have a certain probability of being drafted. Uh, so note that uh, questions about the implementation of the draft system persists regardless of the desired size of the military. Uh, now, in the discussions of revisions to the draft, uh, the uncertainty in itself was framed as a cost being borne uh, by members of the population. Uh, as the selective service system notes prior to the introduction of a more structured process for randomization, men knew only that they were eligible to be drafted from the time they were 18 until they reached the age of 26. So coding the, the selective service system, this lack of a system resulted in uncertainty for the potential draftees during the entire time they were within the draft eligible age group. All throughout a young man's early 20s, he did not know if he would be drafted. So the system that were subsequently introduced to address this concern specified priority groups according to age, which had the effect of deliberately producing non-uniform probabilities of being drafted in any given year. So uh, under the, this new system, some people were selected with higher than average probability and others with lower than average probability. So we viewed in terms of probability distributions of harm, these policy uh, change had the effect of concentrating the 
probabilities more heavily on a subset of the eligible population each year, rather than diffusing the probability more evenly across uh, the entire population. So the decision and uh, the decision to uh, and the and the interpretation to uh, reduce uh, and the interpretation of this uh, new randomization scheme as uh, reducing the cumulative uncertainty is very much in uh, in keeping with the predictions of probability weighting, where the uh, prediction of our model is that when allocating uh, harms, if we want to minimize the perceived uh, uh, the perceived harm, we need to pick a smaller subset of the population and concentrate the risk more heavily on that subset. Okay, so that was our analysis for the case of harm. Now let's quickly overview to the case of uh, maximizing the perceived benefit. So uh, in our paper, we analyzed the case of allocating our units of uh, benefit among n individuals and characterize the perceived benefit maximizing allocations. In particular, we show that uh, the number of individuals who receive a non-zero probability of getting the benefit is always n, the total size of the population, regarding the uh, size of the benefit to be distributed. Uh, in addition, and perhaps surprisingly, for a fixed value of uh, the uh, n, the total size of the population, if the benefit level R is sufficiently large, the optimal solution allocates probabilities in a two-tier manner where a subset of individuals receive the benefit with certainty and the remaining individuals have equal but less than one chance of obtaining remaining, uh, the remaining benefit. So uh, one question here, here is how large R should be relative to the size of the population for at least one individual to receive the benefit with certainty in the perceived benefit maximizing allocation. And we established in the paper that the necessary and sufficient condition is for R to be roughly linear in M. So um, as uh, with the case of distributions of harms, uh, it is useful to interpret these theoretical findings by asking how they reflect real world scenarios. So uh, note that when the total benefit R uh, is small relative to the size of the population, uh, the allocation that maximizes the perceived benefit is a uniform lottery in which everybody has an equal chance of receiving the benefit in question. And examples of uniform lotteries are widespread, so I'm not going to go into the details of that. Um, when R is large relative to N, our theory suggests that there will be a two-tiered uh, allocation of probabilities with some people receiving it with certainty, others receiving it with positive but less than one uh, probability. So uh, examples of such multi-tiered uh, uh, approach is uh, also uh, can also be found in practice, in particular in the case of allocating hunting permits and um, entry to the NYC Marathon. For details, please uh, see the paper. So in summary, we have considered policies that distribute uh, probabilities of harm or benefit across a population and have, have asked uh, how we might distinguish among policies that produce different distribution uh, with the same total expected impact. The theory of probability weighting from behavioral economics provide one natural proposal. We have uh, investigated which type of distributions uh, optimize the perceived benefit or harm uh, if agents are probability weighting and have found that distributions with the characteristics of uh, these optima show up in a diverse uh, range of policy contexts. Um, of course, there are multiple limitations to our models of human perceptions of uncertain allocations. Nonetheless, our work takes an initial step towards understanding these perceptions, and we believe this is an increasingly important question to tackle. For a more detailed discussion of our work, please visit the paper.